Alright. Sir? You know, I can't be sure, but I think my teeth aren't growing. Born in 1947 in Sheffield, South Yorkshire, Thomas Halperin Weiner has always considered live theater to be his first love, saying that he has been a musician and or an actor since the age of 10. He can be seen uncredited in the film An Affair to Remember in his first ever on-screen role as the drummer in the Orphan Band. His on-screen work would not resume for a while, although he would work as ADR talent on the English-language version of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. He also attended UC Santa Cruz, where he graduated in 1970 with a BA in psychology. In 1978, he would begin voicing characters for the English dub of Lupin III, including providing voices in the dub of the movie The Castle of Cagliostro. You may not hear his voice in Speed Racer or Astro Boy, but he was present at the beginning of the modern anime boom in America. Beginning in 1984, Weiner worked for 16 years at Saban Entertainment as an ADR director, head writer, story editor, producer, and voice actor. He estimates that he provided voice work and writing on hundreds of series for the production company and wrote around 2,000 scripts to dub Japanese media for the English language market. He provided voices for five different series of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and narrated 1985's Captain Harlock and the Queen of a Thousand Years. His voice can be heard in Robotech, as well as in the English language casts of VR Troopers, Ghost in the Shell, and Masked Rider, and he was the voice of Grimlock in 2000's Transformers Robots in Disguise. He was also one of my favorite villains, the Teddy Bomber in Cowboy Bebop. This is just a random sampling of his voice work, by the way. If I listed everything he was in and waxed nostalgic about how much I heard his voice as a young anime fan in the 80s and 90s, it would take up the rest of the list. But I will take just a moment to add that he is credited as the director of Attack of the Super Monsters, which is one of my favorite movies to release from Rift Tracks in recent memory. The Earth is ours! Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. All of this work helped to finance Weiner's career in live theater. He has played the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, performed Mammoth at Oregon Stageworks, and appeared as Claudius in Hamlet at the Los Angeles Globe Theater. Weiner has been less active in voice acting and localization since the early 2000s, but he continues to work prolifically as an audiobook narrator, having recorded for Blackstone Audio and Podium Audio, and winning awards for his narration. As he told Audiophile Magazine, Doing live theater is the gravy. Reading audiobooks is my day job. Most people speak of their day jobs with some condescension, but I love my work. I get to read all the parts. And now, let all hearts join in joyous praise of Dolores, Bride of Satan! Hail Dolores, Bride of Satan! <gasps> Hail, Hail Dolores! Dolores. Hail, Hail, Dolores. Hail, Hail to the mighty Lucifer. Lucifer! Hail to the coming of the kingdom of darkness! Starting in 1954, the Comics Code Authority largely determined what was and was not acceptable in American comic books. Aimed at curtailing the violence and sex depicted in the crime and horror comics of the day, the rules seemed to have been written with William Gaines's EC Comics, the publishers of Tales from the Crypt and the Vault of Horror, in mind. Among the original rules was one banning scenes dealing with or instruments associated with walking dead, torture, vampires and vampirism, ghouls, cannibalism, and werewolfism. 
Those who dared to flout the code would not be able to get their comics stocked at newsstands and grocery stores. Which may seem odd now, but those were the major distribution hubs for comics at the time. Over the years following the code's adoption, writers and artists sought out opportunities to poke at the code and see what they could get away with, in part to strike a blow for freedom of expression, but probably mostly because it's fun to do fun things. Destroyed. In one of my favorite instances, DC's House of Secrets published a story introduced as having been told, quote, by a wandering wolf man. When the Comics Code Authority threatened to pull the comic over the use of the word, it was pointed out that Wolfman was, in fact, the last name of the writer, Marv Wolfman. In compromise, the CCA allowed the comic to be released with their approval as long as Marv Wolfman was visibly and explicitly credited as the writer on the first page of the story. All of this poking and prodding led the code to be revised in 1971, and the ban on vampires, ghouls, and werewolves was lifted, provided that they were handled in the classic tradition, such as Frankenstein, Dracula, and other high-caliber literary works. Marvel Comics responded by immediately developing a new title starring the now-public domain Dracula. The first issue of The Tomb of Dracula hit newsstands in April of 1972. The first few issues saw some shuffling of the creative team, but ultimately, the writing duties fell on none other than Marv Wolfman. Artist Gene Colan would handle pencils for the entirety of the series' 70-issue run, basing the look of Dracula himself off of actor Jack Palance, who, as mentioned earlier in this year's countdown, had not played Dracula yet at the time. The series was a substantial hit, especially in overseas reprints, and it introduced Dracula as a character to the Marvel Universe. Yes, Dracula would actually fight Spider-Man and the X-Men, before ultimately being destroyed by Doctor Strange using the Montesi formula in 1983. Also introduced in the pages of the Tomb of Dracula was none other than Blade. <laughs> How successful was the Tomb of Dracula overseas? Well, in 1980, it was licensed by Toei Animation, the company behind Saint Seiya, Sailor Moon, Galaxy Express 3.9, and Dragon Ball, just to name a few, for a made-for-TV anime. This in spite of the fact that The Tomb of Dracula had yet to be translated for the Japanese market. The story and characters were well enough known that Toei wanted to work on the adaptation. Directed by the Rose of Versailles alum and future director for Dragon Ball, Minoru Okazaki, Marv Wolfman's story was compressed and adapted by Tadaaki Yamazaki, who had previously written Ashita no Jo and worked on the writing teams for Devilman and Lupin the Third. The movie found its way to America in 1983 through Harmony Gold, who retitled it Dracula, Sovereign of the Damned, and distributed it to cable channels for infrequent viewings throughout the 80s. The story sees Dracula awakened in the modern age and moved to Boston. Hunted by the last heir of the Harker family and his own descendant, Frank Drake, he appears to a church full of Satanists who are attempting to sacrifice one of their members as a Bride of Satan. Hail Dolores, Bride of Satan! Dracula steals Satan's intended bride, Domini, and falls in love with her, fathering a child, but Satan discovers that his bride was stolen from him. Yes, Satan is actually a character in this movie and plans to wreak a harsh vengeance on the Lord of Vampires. If this sounds a little complicated, this is about seven years of comic book continuity compressed into just under 90 minutes of animation. I don't think I had realized before I started this countdown just how common the idea of Dracula Family Man really was. Even so, Dracula Sovereign of the Dam's take on Dracula is fascinating in the sheer soap opera-ness of the character. 
torn by his nature and the fact that he has fallen in love with a human and absolutely devoted to protecting his child, this is a Dracula who lives by a code, and that code is family is everything. Unless they're a vampire hunter dedicated to wiping you off the face of the earth, in which case, yeah, screw that guy. The farther the story goes, the more it takes on a dark shadows on acid kind of vibe, combining gothic horror with romance and ultimately outright superheroics. Dracula, Sovereign of the Damned, is a trip and a half. It is sadly more of a cult phenomenon today, although it might have some interest as an early lost Marvel movie. The movie did receive a VHS release from Harmony Gold, but from my research it has not had an official DVD or Blu-ray release. However, it's very popular on the bootleg scene, and you can even find it uploaded to sites like this one that I won't name, but it rhymes with schmoofoob. Tom Weiner was a frequently heard voice in Saban's Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and in the first series, he provided voices for 15 characters, all of them uncredited. Interestingly enough, those voices included the main villain in episode 25, Life's a Masquerade, which just happened to be Frankenstein's monster. Weiner worked with the Power Rangers franchise until he was let go after Disney took the reins. So what do you think of Dracula, Sovereign of the Damned? Maybe you caught it in one of its obscure cable viewings. Or if you're a huge anime nerd, maybe you've gone and sought it out as one of those instances of an anime actually adapted from an American comic book. Or maybe you're just learning about it now for the very first time. Whatever might be the case, drop down into the comments below and let me know. And while you're down there, there's also a button for liking the video and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. You can also ring the little bell that's down there, and that will actually bring you uh, notifications whenever we update this channel, which is a wonderful thing. And there is a share button, which you might also enjoy clicking to share this video with one of your friends, because after all, sharing is caring, and don't you care? Until next time, I am Glenn Williams, the film optimist, reminding you to watch like it means something.